we have park and planning working on something, we get one option. This council is supposed to make a decision. We have no analysis of other ways to do things. So we're left with, if you want to do something different, somebody throws something up against the wall from the administrative side and Glenn throws something up against the wall, it gets whatever consideration the committee can give it in a few minutes. Uh, well, granted, it'll be probably a couple of hours, but well, compared to the length of time today. to analyze a policy and to analyze true alternatives, we don't spend the time to do that. And I, you know, I, I went to some of the charrettes or charades, whatever they were, and you know, went with talk to the community and listen to what people said. And there's no multivariate analysis of how do you reach a different conclusion or how do you reach the same goal. And what I hear scant talk about is adequate public facilities, frankly. I mean, whether or not you want to advance a particular industry or not, at the end of the day, you have to have adequate public facilities. And we have as much a responsibility to residents of this county as we do to the businesses of this county. And when, if you look at the literature on economic development, taxes are not the number one reason that businesses locate places. If that were true, Alabama, Mississippi, and basically the rest of the old Confederacy would be the center of economic development in this country, and it is not. And it's not for a host of other reasons. Lousy education, lousy health care, lousy infrastructure, you name it, lousy stuff. And the fact that they're a cheap place to do business doesn't make it a magnet. And so trying to think that just by being cheap, you're going to be a magnet. And if the price of that is that your schools get overcrowded, that's a problem. And we just did an extraordinary thing, which we're never going to do again. I doubt if this council or any future council is going to raise taxes the way we raise taxes. And we didn't raise enough taxes to actually fix the problem. We made and raised enough taxes to put a dent in the problem. Had we had adequate public facilities payments for transportation and for schools from the beginning, we would not be in this mess today. This is largely a self-inflicted wound. And I don't see why continuing to inflict wounds on ourselves is a particularly good idea. I think you have, to, you have to figure out a balanced way, but at the end of the day, I really believe you have to be able to put the infrastructure in place. Um, I agree with the statement that you, know, you, you can't assume that everyone leaves the Ag Reserve. Good point. Equally good point is not everybody works in smart growth town centers. And you can't pretend that people don't drive from there. You can't say, look at my mode share, oh, never mind the fact that 50% of the 10,000 people I just plopped here are gonna drive. Yeah, I got a 50% mode share out of the new people. I've also got a 50% people using the roads and I'm not doing anything to improve the roads. Um, when you talk about the metro station policy areas, I agree and, I, and it bugs the heck out of me when people just assert that, you, that the purpose of traffic tests is to widen roads and add turning lanes. There's not a turning lane or a road widening in a, in a CBD that I would support. And I can't imagine that the community would support. And there's no place to put the stuff. I mean, drive Bethesda. I do this all the time. Tell me where you're going to widen the road in Bethesda or where you're going to widen an intersection. It's like a straw man being thrown up there. We heard the other night from somebody who said, uh, support my housing project takes pressure off the ag reserve. We took pressure off the Ag Reserve. That's another straw man. Listening to people tell me that if you, know, you don't let them do this here, they're going to go to the Ag Reserve. No, they're not going to the Ag Reserve. The Ag Reserve isn't zoned for this. But not only isn't the Ag Reserve not zoned for this, nowhere else in Montgomery County is zoned for the densities in the CBD. So no one who could build a 200-foot building in Bethesda is going to say, oh, gee, if you don't make it really nice for you, I'm going to put that 200-foot tall building in Alney. It's not happening because it's not zoned for it. It's not happening, it's not happening in Burtonsville. It's not happening hardly anywhere. So this idea that I have to be afraid about, you know, they're going to build these massive buildings someplace else and people are going to be commuting long distances, that's also a straw man. It's completely bogus. But you tell people that and then they, they dutifully repeat these lines to us and it's just not true. So we've got the bones to build on here, but we've got to figure out how you're going to actually build it. And, and the truth is, in metro station policy areas, the only way you're going to serve it is with transit. You're not going to serve it with more cars. So you're going to have to figure out how you build the most expensive thing you do in an environment that's already built out. I don't see the planning board, um, when they're allowing this density and or the one of the other density in Bethesda, I see smaller sidewalks. I don't see any plan for saying, let's widen the street enough to add a bus rapid transit lane down the middle of the street so that we can gain extra 
um, space in order to put transit in here. I see an effort to cram more stuff into the same limited space. So I, to me, I'm looking at this, and I think we've got a host of problems. We've got to raise money to deal with it. Um, you know, so you talked about our competition. So if you were in Fairfax or Northern Virginia, you pay a higher tax rate than Montgomery County has. And if you're a commercial property, you're dinged somewhere between 10 and 11 half cents on every square inch of commercial property. And that goes strictly to transportation under an agreement with the state of Virginia that, you, that the county cannot supplant its spending on transportation with the money they're raising from this commercial property tax. And that, I think, is a really good thing because I wouldn't want to tax the commercial district areas for this and then turn around and reduce the county's contribution to it. Right. They did this in Virginia as an additive. But then if you go to the places where they're developing Virginia that are special, like Tyson's, the taxes they have layered on Tyson's to build in Tyson's, where everybody thinks they're going to attract everybody. You tack on 22.5 cents for the silver line and you tack on another 15 cents or so for the road improvements in Tyson's plus the 10 cents, you've got, I don't know, 40 something cents on top of a tax rate which is higher than ours to begin with to a place that they plan on attracting 100,000 people and God knows how many jobs. So apparently they don't think that they're gonna scare everybody away and we're all worried about them. Everybody thinks that Tyson's gonna be the magnet and what happens to us. So how does the magnet get away with taxing people out the wazoo and we're acting like, oh my God, if I raise a tax on somebody, they're gonna go someplace else. To Tyson's? Really? To Northern Virginia? I don't think so. So I, I, I'm comfortable. I, I think Glenn is more or less in the right direction. I probably would go a little bit higher on the impact taxes, but I, I think you really have to collect money out of the metro station policy areas. It can't be the place where you say you want the most jobs and the most people, and by the way, I'm not gonna raise any money for infrastructure. That's just flat out counterintuitive. And how you level it on everybody else, I don't know. I think the issue of how you deal with, you know, what's the right formula for the Ag Reserve, it would be interesting to look at studies on, on directional movements of people in Montgomery County. That stuff's available. So maybe a rationale would be that, you know, we know, and, and I, you see this, these origin destinations for any development, they tell you where people are coming into development from what part of the region you possibly could make some assumptions about how many people leave the Ag Reserve for work. And it's not, it's not 100%, but it's not 0%. And how many people work and live in the CBDs and how many leave the CBDs. And maybe there's a rationale to be built around that. I can think of ways of scaling things, but you can't have that discussion the way we're having it. The, it's, you know, you're just throwing stuff up against the wall. Um, you could, instead, you could take a special taxing district, you could take a corridor. You could take, I, you could take 355 from Friendship Heights mm -hmm. to um, Clarksburg. You could say, what's the infrastructure you're gonna need to make this corridor function with the development that you've planned for the corridor? Mm -hmm. And you could put a tax on commercial development over 30 years, and you could start bonding on day one, because you know you've got a steady stack tax stream, and say, we're gonna build the infrastructure. And these are the bonds that we're going to float. These are the projects we're going to build. Developers get the certainty of the infrastructure. They know what the tax is going to be. There are ways to do this. And, you know, I've talked to other people who work with other jurisdictions that look at things like that. And I feel like we're just unnecessarily constrained and we're kicking ourselves and trying not to hurt ourselves. But I think we hurt ourselves by not having a full range discussion of what it is we need to do. And I think at the end of the day, whatever we do, ought to be driven by how much money do I have to raise to provide transportation in schools? That's the question we've got to answer for our residents. Otherwise, adequate public facilities has no meaning. And so I think we've got to say, you know, how do I get adequate public facilities and what's it cost to get there? If, if I had my preferences with this subdivision staging policy, I would say I would continue adoption of the current policy for another year, and I would assign some smart people um, to a work group and not let it be picked solely by park and planning or by the executive, but put together a group of people to look at other systems in other parts of the country and see if there's anything which addresses the things we want better than what we're doing now. Because I, you know, my fear is that, you know, we'll, we'll either give in to, I don't want to scare businesses away, which just means we're going to dig the hole deeper than we have right now, or we'll blindly decide we're going to throw these fees here and these fees there, may or may not raise the money we, may, we need, may or may not um, discourage or encourage business, 
But I don't think we have a really good plan, not the plan that came out of park and planning and not much else I've seen. I think we need to not be reactive. This is, you know, we talked about the school decision as kind of a seminal turning point for the county. I kind of look at this decision as a kind of a turning point. If, you, if we decide that adequate public facilities <clears throat> don't matter, and we're not having any tests anywhere, then we're going to be basically abandoning what I think people count on us to do. That's, I don't think that's a good strategy long term. Um, so I guess I, I would rather be patient. I don't think what we're doing now is killing anything. I don't think it's helping anything very much. But I really think we owe it to ourselves to bring in enough brains around here to figure out if you had to raise this much money and you had to build these kind of projects, how would you go about raising the money to do that? That's, that's where I wish we would end up.